Do you hear that? What is that? Uh, James, do you hear that? Yeah. Uh, that can't be good. What? What is that? It's getting louder. Faster. Ah! It's the beginning of the podcast. Welcome to The Complete Musician. Creativity at its core, exploring innovative musical ideas, thoughts, and techniques for the modern musician in today's society, with your hosts, James Nagus and Drew Phillips. Ah! With a diminished chord? Well, it can't end happy. Right? I mean, it's Jaws. It can't end happy. Oh, uh, (laughs) anyway, uh, welcome to the Complete Musician Podcast. I'm Drew. Hey, everybody. I'm James. And we're so glad you're back. And we are here to talk about some more musically inspiring thoughts that we have. Um, we, we do? We we are? Well, at least they're musically inspiring to us. Hopefully to others. Ah, good. Yes. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, well, uh, first to uh, introduce us, if you've never been with us before, uh, before we get into our topic of the day, we are... Then shame to... on you. You need to do your homework. You need to do your research. And we say that in the most loving way possible. And sh- yes, shame, shame on you about, uh, you know, Michelle Tanner from Full House. So shame, shame. Uh, yes, we are two uh, college teachers. Uh, we play the horn. We play the piano. We play checkers. We play the radio. And we also, uh, we are composers. We are also performers. And uh, we are also Taco Bell lovers. All of these things, and probably lots of things we're also forgetting. So we are forgetful. So we have decided to make this podcast that we've been going for over a year now. It's been over a year. I know. We I I was looking. We missed the anniversary. Um, We should have done something. We should have released something. But we'll make up an anniversary episode somewhere. And yeah, we'll do something cool. Uh, But anyway, we are... uh, we do this podcast uh, called The Complete Musician because we believe that to be a musician in today's society, that you need to be not just a uh, jack of all trades, you need to be a master of all trades, right? Or at least a master of a few. Well, yeah. I mean, a, a jack is a good start, but you just want to be able to do more than one thing, at least. You don't want to be a Susan of all trades, and definitely not a Janet or a Carol of all trades. Because you they see. are simple-minded, and they just, all they do is know how to push buttons. Right. Or no Bobbies of all trades, no uh, Michaels of all trades. Definitely, right. at least, right. So, you want to be more than just a player, is our point. So, anyway, that is where we come from, and so we bring you these insightful thoughts that we have that might hope to inspire inspire you so anyway we're in the middle of a mini series right now and our mini series is taking some technique of playing and trying to introduce some really creative ways to get better at said technique and so far uh james have me remember what we've done we've done yeah, articulation. articulation was one we've done trills oh yes that was a fun one trills, trills. That was, yeah it was kind of like some flexibility mess uh, right. let's see, the we did, last one we did. Wait, did we do a warm up one? That was a separate thing in and of itself, I think. I think in yeah. the technique series, yeah. But we did, um, we did metronome was the most recent one. Yeah, we did like rhythm. Rhythm, yes. Rhythm, yeah. And so today, uh, and again, these are all just creative ideas that we have. Uh, James actually doesn't know the topic because I never tell him beforehand, which makes this nope. all the more fun for me. Womp womp. And so today, the fun topic that we want to improve and talk about briefly is tone. Mm. What is tone? Uh, Tone is like that voice that you get when you're uh, talking really mean to your parents and trying to convince them that you know everything and they don't. That's a tone. That was a rhetorical question, but it's okay that you answered it. (laughs) That's, you know, when you get called out, when your parents are like, don't use that tone with me. It's like, that's a tone, right? That is. It's a state of emotion. Well, it's a state of being. 
It is well, my parents a said that to me color time, of your so, skin you know. when you go to Florida and you're outside for a long time. It's also when you oh, exercise, like you get toned. You get to- oh, that's a good one. And yeah, g- and like going to the gym, that's a great analogy for playing. But that's not our focus today. All right, if you do, that's uh, Planet Fitlips. That's the gym to go to. Yes, please go to Planet Fitlips. Uh, check out previous podcasts for a free month of membership. Anyway, mm-hmm. and a promo code there. And anyway, we'll link it in the bottom or something. Anyway, so uh, tone. So yeah, tone is just like the, honestly, I think of it primarily as the vowel shape or the sound that you're playing with, right? Right, yeah, it's it's the sound. It's tone, it's tone yeah. color, it's timbre, it's all these things yeah. that mean the same thing, but it's still this kind of um, elusive, like, you're right, what does it actually mean? Right. How do you get it? How do you change it? Exactly. Right. And so I think that some of the ways that we can practice, you know, with tone are definitely forming your sound concept and finding out and defining to us what a good tone in tone is. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. I think tone is a little bit different to everybody. And I don't think that's such a bad thing. Like, I think some people... Uh, you know, think that they have great tones and other people would prefer to sound something different. And there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Yeah, that can be, in general, a really tricky thing, like you said, because objectively, right, there shouldn't be one single type of sound. That would be boring. I mean, it would just be like a Mm -hmm. sine wave, right? Mm -hmm. It's the unique way Mm -hmm. that we combine the overtones that makes the, the timbre different. And every student or every person's sound, if they like their sound, um and it it works fundamentally, then there's no reason why you should necessarily change it. But I think your point of, well, let's define what a bad sound is. What are the elements of a, a bad tone? Because then right. that's the only reason why you would go and change something, right? Right, or want to adjust it. And I think that no matter what kind of tone you have, whether some people say they have a bright tone or sound or a dark sound or something like that that you can divide with or decide with those qualifiers. I think some elements, like you were saying, of bad tone are things that are closed or muffled or uh, I've, uh, I've had fun using the word oinky that I've heard before. Mm-hmm. You don't want oh, to yes. sound oinky. Right. And especially and so, we find these in like the lower register is much easier to sound oinky. At least on horn. Very oinky. Oh, yeah. Or like a cow, maybe mm. mooey. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't want to sound oinky or mooey or like any other farm animal that you know. Right. So, what, uh, so I was thinking about some ways that you improve tone or at least kind of learn how to change tone. So one of my favorite I- ideas, I'd love to hear yours, but one of the uh, ones that I learned from a festival I went to a long time ago it was concerning it, it, this was primarily concerning kind of the mid to lower register but at the same time it i found it really useful in the high register especially if you're finding or someone has told you or you realize when listening to yourself that your tone do, it sounds kind of closed and so by closed i think to me i'd love to hear you weigh in to me a closed sound or one that doesn't uh have a lot of overtones going on doesn't have this like hum or kind of golden sound that goes with it it's kind of like this hum that i always hear when i'm it's like uh, i'm playing and i can hear like all the lower overtones bouncing around as i'm playing does that make sense yeah well that's just that's resonance right the sound doesn't have resonance and it won't carry right and so when i find that that's an issue and i'm not resonating or hearing like this hum as i'm playing then I probably need to investigate whether or not I'm as open as possible or creating my best sound. So one way that I found to do this and um, a a teacher instructed me to do is to take a note, and this is something you can try, is to take a sound and as you're playing it, drop the jaw as far as you can as you're playing and then let the pitch sag and then sag as low as possible, like bending the pitch down, and then push the air kind of, she described it as kind of pushing it up a half pipe or really um, in an exponential way so that it pushes the pitch back into a place where it's in tune. Mm. And from there, you can find a really open, you know, oral cavity and open place for the pitch to be able to resonate. Now, you may not be able to produce uh, that, 
you know, openness of the mouth all the time, but at least you're in a, a direction that's kind of opening up. So you can find you can still produce that tone um, that you want, or at least with a more open mouth. Well, I think that brings up two of the most important kind of pieces of making a good tone, which is number one, being, like you said, being open, having a good vowel shape or an appropriate vowel shape for the range you want to play in. And number two is supporting with enough air. If you don't have enough air and you have a too thin of a sound or thin of a, a vocal set, then yeah, that'll be thin sound. And we don't, we don't want that. Or at least Absolutely. I don't think and we do. <laughs> are you eating no. cookies over and there? So what, is that a, like a, is that a, are you opening a package of was... Oreos? I'm sorry, it was a cliff bar. I'm really hungry. It was the loudest thing I've... It's like as loud as those sun chip bags that they had to recall because they were bursting were... people's eardrums. <laughs> it was a cliff bar. I'm starving. Okay, so... Is this uh, draining well, your okay. nutrients so quickly that you need had... to replenish those electrolytes? Uh, excuse me. And, <laughs> okay, don't even say that this is healthy because this is one of those chocolate mint chocolate bars... It like has protein. Cool mint chocolate bars. You what? It has protein. That's not too bad for you. Oh, it's so good. It's just like 250 calories, so it's like super heavy. Whatever. Anyway, you don't have to be. Um, I'll forgive you this time. So <laughs> thinking about tone um, and that kind of exercise, like you were just talking about with those elements, th that exercise I just described primarily works in the low register, I think, or at least it has helped my low, res low register a lot. Ooh, can't talk tonight. But I've also used it in the high register. Uh, obviously, you can't drop as far without the pitch changing because of how close the partials are up there. But it is good to be able to play up there and open and clear, which I think we all want to play right. in the high register without sounding pinched. Exactly. Uh, I know. So, oh, oh for me, the, the one thing I would add to it. your <laughs> to your your thing, and something that's worked uh, for me and my students too, is. There's two parts. There's the kind of the vowel shape, right? So especially if we're dealing with low, it's that kind of imagining that it's an oval or a tall O or even like you have a big jawbreaker or, a, you know, a golf ball inside your mouth so you stay open. But also there's – I've had uh, instances where that's been open but the sound has still been small and it's because the kind of the back of the throat is still really t tight and closed down. Um, and so getting – like trying to yawn – and getting that position where you're really just, you're open and relaxed. And then, yeah, so that kind of openness in the back of the throat and then maintaining that. But a lot of experimentation, like you said, just going to the extreme, opening too far, and then kind of coming back from there. That's a great way to figure it out. Totally. So uh, the other exercise I have for, you know, thinking about tone colors um, I, I think that's a good way to, to open up your tone. But let's say you want to change your tone color. Like when I played, so I don't play it anymore, but you know, you remember when I played my Hoyer, mm -hmm. like I played Hoyer for a really long time. So that horn is really big and heavy. It's very heavy and made mostly uh, nickel. So my sound was always very, 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 very dark. Always had a very dark sound. Um, I've actually... People had told me that it almost sounded trombone esque at times because it was. Were they trying really to dark. give you a compliment or was that an insult? I don't know. Uh, I drowned them afterwards. <laughs> so, anyway, that I'm just kidding. I didn't drown anyone. <laughs> that was not an admission of guilt. Or, anyway, so I'm not sure, but that is what I've been told. So, I. Uh, but I didn't always want to play so dark. Like, at times when I was playing in Woodwind Quintet and, tu and tuning with the bassoon, like, that was really helpful. Mm -hmm. But at times when I was playing the Hoyer and playing, like, the Oasin Trio with flute and piano, dark, not always the color I'm going for. Like, I'm going for a brighter sound, right? right. So one way that I found is really subtle differences, but honestly, I found it's made a big difference. I've uh, to practice changing tone color and to practice giving life and different kind of characteristics to pieces. One of the things that I've done is I've played, you know, we talk about playing familiar melodies all the time because we think it's really helpful for ear training and all these other kind of exercises that we've done. Um, so one of the things I've done is I've taken familiar melodies and played them with extreme vowel shapes. 
Hmm, not really thinking so much about accuracy, but thinking how does this change what the sound is and recording myself and listening afterwards. I was really amazed in playing something simple like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, even in the mid-range, going from like an O or even doing something crazy to like an O sound mm -hmm. to something like raising the tongue in the back of my throat in like the bottom of the staff area and going for like an E sound, how mm. different I could make that sound. And just by tongue placement, I could really change not only the resonance, but the intonation of what I was doing and what kind of sound quality I was getting. Right. Well, it's one of those things where I think sometimes we just don't even realize that that's an, a possibility. It's like I can actually, I have that power to change that sound. And it's mm -hmm. the same reason why, you know, some people, if they're playing, it's like, again, to bring up mid to low register, and it's kind of a, a thin sound. And you go, do you like that sound? Like, no. Like, well, why are you playing it that way? I don't know. I don't know. It's like, you can change that, you <laughs> I know. Don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Right? I don't know. And I think it's just, it's cool to have that possibility. Um, because I think that can bring life to a piece of music. If you decide that you're playing uh, something that you've invented a storyline along with it, uh, then, you know, you could completely change characters just because of your vowel shape, which is mm -hmm. a really cool kind of adaptable characteristic to have in your playing. Mm -hmm. So anyway, those are my tone games or at least tone things that you can try. Um so the first one's more of like improving your tone in all registers. And the other is um, kind of seeing what you can change to add to your musical portfolio as a player. So do you have any mm -hmm. more tone games or are we all out? Uh, not so much games. I just, you know, I just tell my students like, look, obviously always play with a beautiful sound. And I want you to be very honest with yourself and never let yourself not play with a beautiful sound. So record yourself, listen, or even in the moment, just think like, do I really like the sound of this note? Yes? Okay, good. No? Well then, okay, let me figure out a way to change it. And then the exercises, like you said, you know, would come into play. Um, mostly, I guess, if I had to sum it up, it's just experimentation into, okay, what can I do that actually changes the sound? Because, of course, horn playing being more internal the mechanics we can't see and fix everything so we just ha we can't say like exactly how someone should change their shape because everyone's shaped differently but if we give them the tools to say try this try this try this then they'll figure it out okay so that's all for tone talk and for our uh mini series um but i have a new segment that we're doing Ooh, what's that oh yeah it's called the improv update <laughs> So I've been doing improv with my kids and uh, at LU, and it's been very enlightening because this whole year is a focus on improv. And so I thought I'd give an update just in case anyone is actually thinking about doing improvisation and the little schedule that I created and what we've done every single week and how they've received it really quickly, briefly, like in 60 seconds or less. So Good. And go. Anyway. Okay, so the first week we did rhythm games, which I explained on the rhythm podcast, uh, I think, last time in our mini series, which was doing things like counting to eight and picking an accent within those. And then you pick two accents, and then you pick three accents, and then you can put notes with it. And then uh, you can pick, like, uh, two notes, and then you can pick three notes. And then I took a piece of paper with 64 lines, and I told them to circle 32 of them. And then we clapped and counted, and then we played on those. And sometimes we play two notes of a scale, sometimes three, sometimes five, and then sometimes the whole scale. It was a really big... Uh, brain game for them. So that was really fun. Anyway, that was the first week. And that really helped in subdivision because they, the kids realized that keeping a pulse was really, really tough when they uh, didn't have a metronome going and when we tried to do it uh, with things like sustained notes as opposed to really short notes. So that was really uh, helpful to them. Okay, so that was the first week, right? Right. I that think was under that 60 was, seconds, that was a, right? That was a lot, of, a lot of stuff right there. Okay. Anyway. If you want to listen to that again, then just slow it down. Right. So, um, anyway, okay, so that was the first week. We're into the second week now. So I want to talk about what I'm doing in the second week. So in the second week of improv, this may be a little longer than 60 seconds, but just to explain. So I first started with rhythm games this week. And, of course, that always works, like I said, subdivision. 
and then picking like two or three accents within a count of eight, um, sometimes using the metronome and then usually weaning them off of it. And it really helps to establish pulse and downbeat and independence, which is really cool because that's great, especially with our listening. Now we don't have to work on rhythm by looking at a piece of paper or doing rhythm exercise out of Arbens, which is like, bleh, because no one wants to do that. Anyway, so we did that. And the other thing uh, we did this week is we've done melody games. So we've done uh, what we know Jeff likes to call rainbow scales. Oh, yes, we did those two. Yes, and rainbow scales is uh, we have two people, and so you pick maybe... Uh, we've done five notes of a scale of a key. First we do it with a key that we're familiar with. I put a metronome on and I say I'm gonna play um, I'm gonna play a, the first five notes of this scale in whole notes up and down and uh, with this metronome and you're gonna play the first five notes of this scale up and down but in any way you'd like but you have to go straight up and down you can go as many times up and down as you want but you get to play however you want to and you get to make as many sounds as you want and what kind of cool sounds you want. So that's always really cool because not only are they making music and choosing rhythms by themselves because no choice is made for them, uh, they're investigating playing with another person and making kind of cool sounds, but with just five notes. So it's cool. After we do that one time, we talk about use of silence. We talk about uh, other musical kind of tools that they have. I always emphasize giving them the power to use different things. Like I say, you have the power to play 50% of the time and rest 50% of the time. You have the power to use dynamics. You have the power to uh, repeat notes. You have the power to change dynamics. And so it's empowering them, which they really enjoy. Um, and it also gets them thinking about making motives or repeating ideas. And every single time they do it the second time where they, like I said, rest 50% of the time and play 50% of the time, they all, you know, afterwards I say, do you think, you know, we discuss it. And then I say, do you think someone listening would rather listen to the time you did it the first time, which inevitably they play 100% of the time or the second? And they always say the second. It's always so much better when there's rest in there. We discuss what rest does. Uh, but we've done rainbow scales. So this uh, past week, I've done two familiar keys and then one unfamiliar key. Ooh. So I've always done... <laughs> it's ominous. Fun. It's been scary because I say, you know, because, you know, with the trumpets, we have to transpose. With the horns, I just say our pitch. But it's fun going with the trumpets and saying, okay, so we're going to work in A major. You know, until they realize they have to transpose and it's their B scale, they're just, they're, oh, this is okay. And then B, oh, what is B major? And so then they have to learn B major, and it's a great scale study for them. Um, and so they're getting used to playing in B major without really thinking about it. It's really cool. Um, and so the other thing that we did this week is we did overtone series play with a drone that I have on my tuner. And so on my tune, I put these drones on, uh, and we play uh, what I call mountain calls, which is playing in the overtone series, and they make up short little melodic statements. And first, I let them do it on their own. Then I remind them of their musical tools that they can use, which the next time they do use. And the last thing we do for the day is we play a game of communication where it's kind of call and response, in which I make up a little motive. It's got to be very short. And they make up the motive, but add something to it. Hmm. So they can either add a note onto the motive, or uh, they can add a different rhythm, or they can change it completely. So this week has been super cool because they, they a lot of them have remarked the phrase, I'm finally starting to get it. This doesn't seem as scary anymore. Hmm. When it's all about chunking and about steps, and limitations. Yeah, and about sequencing. Yeah, and right. uh, and gradually taking those away. But anyway, I'm going to keep sharing in my improv update about what we've done and what kind of things are being worked on. Because this week was, you know, working on unfamiliar keys and scales and independence of making a motive and what makes music interesting, you know, um, what kind of, and what kind of musical tools they have in their arsenal. So I'm giving them the power to be able to create something on their own. Well, you're introducing all of these individual musical building blocks and if in and of themselves, they're just blocks, but when you combine them, you can make a house or even a castle. 
So I think that sounds like a great sequence that you're doing. And I look forward to hearing how uh, comfortable and then maybe daring they get with their improvisation. Yeah. So anyway, that's the end of improv update. Back to you. Back to me. And here I am. And well, let's do this. Last time we did a first little segment called Food for Thought, and then we talked about changing the name, but we never did, so it's still Food for Thought. Wait, I um, thought it was Mood for Thought. Mood for Thought. Oh, that's right. This week is a new segment, a brand new, completely new segment called Mood for Tots. Um, and uh, potato tots, you know, those kinds. Lots of them. So anyway, just interesting musical facts that we can talk about so for this one i need you to give me a number between one and 20 Mm, nine okay so by the way this is the classic fm's 20 downright bizarre classical music facts okay all right and number nine is (laughs) what (laughs) dogfish skin and it shows a picture of this cute little fish Dogfish skin was often used in the 18th century to sand violins. What do you think about a, that? Wait, a dogfish? Like, so it's a fish, and its skin a, was used to sand violins. It, but you said dogfish? Mm-hmm. Is that like cat dog? Is that like half fish, half, half dog? Um... I don't know, but looking by the picture, it looks like a fish, but it maybe it retrieves things. I'm not sure. It's possible. Okay, so, okay, so I'm pretty sure this is a mythical creature because dogfish doesn't make sense unless it's cat dog. I mean, that, that clearly right. exists. But um, it used to sand violins. Mm-hmm. I skin? guess that's I, that, I guess that's before uh, 3M or whatever that company is made sandpaper. They just someone had the happy accident of dropping a fish onto a violin and saying, "Oh, this made my violin really rough." No, that sounds great. Wait, didn't 3M also make uh, sticky notes and like, yeah, glue yeah. or something? Oh, okay. I know the history of the sticky note. Did you know that? Do tell. Um, oh, wait, In a very it, short, thirty seconds or less. Um, um uh, uh they made sticky notes that's all i know something about microbes and bacteria and a, isn't it a dude named alex fleming didn't he make sticky notes um or no it was that bubble gum i can't remember anyway mm. okay i'm done all right do you want to um, do one more uh give me yes, another number between another. one and 20 uh yes um okay another number between one and 20 um i want number wait does this go from like weirdest to no least weird it's, oh, just, it's just random it's random okay um i want number 16 Okay. Uh, oh, this one's just boring. Pick another okay, number. Okay, uh, 15. What is it with this list and dogs? Okay. <laughs> Franz <laughs> Liszt received so many requests for lock of his hair that he bought a dog and sent fur clippings instead. That is so creepy. That Who is... would want someone's hair? <laughs> that is so weird. <laughs> weird i love your piano piece can i have your hair like who who does that were people trying to do a like a seance or like curse him or what (laughs) they're trying to yeah they're making voodoo dolls of him they're gonna set a sicilian hex on him and then like yeah they're making little wow that is so weird people were so they were so mad that they couldn't perform his music because it was difficult that they wanted to at least humiliate him by making him like patchy Uh, bald (laughs) <laughs> they wanted to get rid of his hair and bald him early. Wow, that is really creepy. So he sent them dog's hair instead? Yep. What kind of dog was it? It does not say. I, I can only color... assume it was what not like a chihuahua have? because that would be way too small and way too short-haired. Oh, it would probably be something like a little Pomeranian, don't you think? Because they have lots of hair. They're like a little mop uh... just walking around with little stubby legs. Yeah, they probably wouldn't let you cut their hair. That would bite your finger. Okay, maybe he got... Okay, let's think about this. Maybe he got a dogfish. Oh, maybe he did. Because if you think about... Then he probably was bald. Because if it's leathery, I mean... 
Maybe. You know, dogfish hair. Uh, so maybe I he wore a wig, it. and that's his what people hair... saw, and they uh. wanted. The, his hairstyle totally determined the dog, because think about it. If he had, like, an afro, then he totally got a poodle. But if he had, like, really long, flowing, like, you know, locks, um, then it's definitely like a Pomeranian or like a lab or something. All right. It depends on when in, the, in his life that they wanted his hair, because all these pictures of old list are, like, nasty. It's like a... a broom on his head you're such a broom head <laughs> a like broom? it's like a mop it is a white mop but if it was okay. younger then it was i don't know okay so it was an albino pomeranian if he was super old or <laughs> and then here's a picture of franz list with a cat beard <laughs> thank you internet <laughs> the, the internet is a glorious place okay I, we should move it, on okay we're gonna move on okay um and then our last segment are you ready because no. this is a segment you don't know about. I am not ready, but go for it anyway. Okay, this is a rapid-fire question. You have to say, uh, yes, I'm doing it to you now. So okay. just like we do to our guests. Uh, and it's a little bit of story, so you can tell a quick story about it, but you have to answer the question, okay? Okay. I, I'm going to answer it, too. Um, okay, t- these are, there are three questions. Do I, wait, do I have to related. answer, uh, like, truthfully, actually, honesty? Yes. Okay. Yes, you have to answer truthfully. Okay, here you go. Uh, these are just to fun facts for people to know about you. What is the weirdest gig you've ever played? The weirdest gig was one where we didn't even finish playing the music before the concert. It was one rehearsal, one concert. We got through half of the pieces and then didn't even know what we were playing on the concert until it was called. I think what? you may know that one, too. Was I there? You were there for that one. I remember that. That was the weirdest gig you've ever played. Um, also because the fourth horn... Uh, left her horn in, at home. So it showed up without a horn. I remember this. Okay, <laughs> yes, I was there. Okay, uh, to protect the privacy of the innocents, we will... Get... Share yep. no more details. <laughs> I remember the that, the Iowa. Um, anyway, so the uh, weirdest gig I've ever played was for a wedding, and I, uh, I was supposed to be uh, the only music for the ceremony, um, and so it was outside in December and I, it was a, and there was a, a cabin and I got to the venue and it was in the middle of the woods and they said, Oh, go around to the back. And they had this cabin that was like screened in. And so I went in there and there was a fire burning and because it was, you know, freezing in North Carolina. And so I was, uh, I was sitting in the back and um, they said, okay, so you're just going to start playing, and we'll come let you know when, like, you're done. And they said, oh, make sure you tend to the fire because it'll get kind of cold. What? And so my audience was uh, is either an alpaca or a llama. I don't know the difference. A but llama. he stared at me the entire time I was playing. And so I didn't know what to take for this because they gave me no rep suggestions. So I just brought, like, a bunch of standards. Like, I, I, bought, I brought, like, a bunch of Nat King Cole, like, Mona Lisa and uh, like Unforgettable and like Love on Rose and then like some Shoemaker Etudes and so I played and I started playing about three o'clock and uh, I heard nothing I just played for an hour and 15 minutes until about 4 15 I heard a bunch of noise inside the cabin and then some woman who was I so guess the wedding planner came around the side and she said oh you're still here yeah, we finished oh, this ceremony like 45 minutes ago. Like, you've just been playing for no one. Here's your check. You're free to go. What? I was freezing. It was the worst. It Well, it was the weirdest gig ever. I've never played for an hour and 15 minutes for a very interested alpaca before. They're okay. very judgmental, like you said, though. So not a good audience. No. Anyway, so that was uh, the weirdest gig I've ever played. More mm. details uh, upon request for that story because mm-hmm. there's more. But anyway, okay, next question. What is the worst clam you've ever had? The worst clam I've ever had? Oh, gosh. Not the food. Let me clarify. Not oh, the food. Oh, okay. Um, like in a concert or just in general? In general. What is the worst clam you <laughs> wish you could get back? <laughs> Oh, I I don't remember because I think I've honestly mentally blocked most of them out. Um, <laughs> but I do recall there are some, and again, you were there because it was in rehearsal for yes. one of the one of the school groups, and 
you know, we we both take the approach in playing of just kind of going for things. So like, if, oh, yeah. if we do clam, it's gonna be big. And there was just, okay. I don't know, I splatted something against the wall, and it was just, it was huge. Like I, I think I hit every note around the note I was supposed to, which I think <laughs> technically is was like a, a, a splooey or a splatter. I forget <laughs> what the technical term is, but it was. Well, <laughs> and all you can do at that point is just laugh. Was like it you on just like, put the horn down and just laugh. <laughs> was it on like till or something? When we did till, or was it like death and, or uh, not uh, Zarathustra or something? It may it may have been yeah, also Sprock. But That's there's hilarious. some going for some high note or something, and like any horn player knows that sometimes it doesn't work out. Yeah, it just doesn't. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Okay, but my I, worst. I wish I had a more was, specific one. Oh, uh, my worst claim was in uh, rehearsal. And uh, it was in my sophomore year of college, and I was I, unfortunately we were not there. Um, but we were playing Pines of Rome, and it was in the ends of Pines of the Appian Way. I was on principal, and we we're playing. And right, you know that last note for the first one is a high A that you just mm. have to sustain forever. And then when the conductor cut off, I pinched it up, and it went to a really <laughs> resonant B flat. Ooh, just boo and it just like rang over the orchestra, and everyone turned to like stare at me, nice. and I just like buried my face because at that point I was like you know really concerned about you know being embarrassed in front of other people because you know I was like nineteen uh, right. and stupid, and right. so I was just like hid my face, and the orchestra conductor was like said don't let that happen again or something oh, and he geez. was Come oh on. he was and he was joking like oh, it wasn't okay. a serious thing he was joking and like everyone laughed and it was fine but i got so many like comments on my wall that day on facebook <laughs> people were like was that you and i'm like no, please leave me alone anyway that was my worst clam and i remember yeah. by the way i remembered my my favorite one now oh it, it okay. occurred to me so this was in youth orchestra i think i was in middle school still at the time or like mm-hmm. early high school so it, i think it was middle school um gosh is it in the hall of the mountain king that starts off with the octave stopped like Ugh, d's or so. something like that so like sharp. sharps or something or something one sharp. of those notes yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so in every rehearsal up to that point the second horn couldn't play find their lower octave and it was just a struggle bus <laughs> and then we get to the concert they hit their note, and I hit everything around that note. So very beginning of the piece, instead of, I think it went, and it just, just the look, because really... that's all that's going on. It's just two horns playing yeah. that octave, right? And the conductor's face when that happened. I forget what he said afterwards. Like that was a that was an interesting one, wasn't it? Uh, oh man, I love. I, and oh the best God. part is, I think I have that on a CD somewhere too. And we're going to find that. And uh, we'll play yes, it in that, a future episode. Yeah, we'll find it at some point. Um, that's <laughs> that's very funny. You just were really creative in your um, turn. I was adding ornamentation. It was just he was just uncultured enough to realize it. Generating musical interest, whatever. Okay. And last question: What is your favorite disaster story from an actual performance? It doesn't have to be with you. It can be with anything. Oh, um, because I totally have mine. Mine's from I musical figured theater. you had. I figured you had one in mind, and you. I guess musical theater is a treasure trove of disaster oh, and yo oh yeah okay and craziness. Um, you know what? Can, why don't you go first, and I'll think about mine. Okay, so my favorite one is probably one that you've heard, and it was the first time I was playing Phantom of the Opera, and sitting there in the pit playing, and in. The Phantom of the Opera, when the masquerade theme first appears, it's when they find the, and they have the little monkey, um, and they, you know, twist the little knobs, and it does the little tinkly music box, da-da-dee, da-da-da-da-da-dee-dum. Well, that's supposed to be played on the piano, right? And Mm -hmm. so it's one of the pianists in the pit, because there's a ton of pianos in Phantom of the Opera, covering just everything. And so, but instead of playing that, the pianist, she hits some button on the <laughs> keyboard and it went into this like casbah beat and so it went <laughs> instead of da 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 it went doom da doom da doom da da doom da doom da da and I died laughing. The actors on stage are just frozen like who? 
<laughs> like, this isn't the sound I was expecting. And the piano, she couldn't find the button to turn it off. So it just kept going for, it must have been five to seven seconds. And the conductor, she's just like, what do we do? And so when she finally <laughs> right. turned it off, like, it was just dead silent. Because she had to find the right patch uh, to turn it back. Oh, uh, oh my gosh. I... I, I think I missed my next entrance because I was crying laughing <laughs> because that was just Phantom of the Opera is haunted anyway because it's the Phantom but that was just one of my favorite musical theater moments I loved it oh jeez I feel like keyboards have the potential to royally mess things up I love it um, gosh I was thinking I, I still don't have a good one I know there are so many but if I had to answer on the spot right now um, just because it's probably fresh in my mind from just talking about it too. It was, it, this may have not been the performance, but I think it was like the dress rehearsal. And it was the very beginning of also Sprock where, you know, the trumpets have their little bum, bum, bum. Yeah. And then everyone comes in with, including organ. Unfortunately, yeah. the organist uh, hit a button and instead of this nice long tone, I think it was either like a harpsichord tinkle <laughs> or like a gunshot. I don't remember which one it was, but it was not what it was supposed to be. A gunshot. <laughs> boo, boo. It was like what? Yeah, more like the the laser cannon or something like that. <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, oh, I, I, I feel like there was another story too about an 1812 overture with like a pre-recorded, you know, cannons and something happened at it, like. It oh, did man. not sound like cannons. It sounded like someone making the fart sound with their hand or something like that. I don't know. I can just imagine. That's <laughs> hilarious. There are so many more. But anyway, that's, you know, those are my three questions. But maybe we'll keep doing these. Maybe next time you should ask the questions. Uh, I will think up some good ones. Cool. Well, that's going to wrap up our episode for uh, today. Thanks for listening to us. We appreciate it. And we'll be back soon uh, with more fun surprises from... Uh, your favorite two uh, Taco Bell lovers here. Mm -hmm. And if you have any comments or questions, feel free to pop something in the box below or uh, find us at cormotohorn at gmail.com and also on Facebook. So you can link up with us on all of those different venues and we'd love to hear from you. And as Helen Keller said, keep your face to the sunshine and you cannot see the conductor. <laughs>